welcome back to the Common Connected Podcast. I'm your host, Janine Halloran, and on today's podcast, I get to interview one of my good colleagues and friends, Lynn Kenny. So she's a pediatric psychologist, and her work is really focused on executive function. And she also talks about music and rhythm. She has some amazing books out there, amazing programs. And on today's podcast, we really focus on executive function and building executive function skills and ways we can work with kids that are toddlers and teenagers. So I hope you enjoy our podcast interview together. Thanks. Oh my goodness, Lynn, Kenny, I'm so excited <laughs> to have you on my podcast. Oh, it's great to see you again. It's been way too long. It has been way too long. So you and I know each other really well, but my audience may not know of you and your work. So if you could just give us a little bit of background on who you are and what you do, that'd be great. Sure. Um, my name is Lynn Kenny. I'm a pediatric psychologist in Scottsdale, Arizona. I've been licensed for about 27 years and I work in executive function, self-regulation and social emotional skills. Um, I work, I love my work and I love my research. I work at the Wellington Alexander Center for the treatment of dyslexia and I've actually learned so much. Um, the kids actually Janine, move from their states, then they live in our state for eight to 12 weeks, I know. And they see five different clinicians each day for five hours in a day. And I'm the person on the team, I have the funnest part. I my, like my, this is my home, but my office is like this, except much more cluttered with drums and I've got a trampoline. And, and so I'm the person who works on the executive function skills. So that's really an honor. Um, so yeah, that's who I am. Just a pediatric psychologist trying to improve some kids' lives. Oh my goodness. I, whenever I think of you, I think about music, rhythm, movement, executive functioning. Like that is where I go um, whenever. And I, I remember once you were, just, we were sitting together and you were drumming. <laughs> and you were like working on a different curriculum for music. And you were just like, I just, I, I feel like this, the connection between music and executive functioning, it's really mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. So People may not know what exactly is executive function and what are executive function skills. So can you just give us a brief overview of what that means? Sure, sure. So we're going to have like a friendly conversation about it, not an academic conversation because yes. people do see it differently. I'm going to tell you how we talk to real kids in real life about what EF is and what we say to parents. So it's interesting because executive function is actually a collection of self-regulatory cognitive control processes, right? And they're divided into different domains, but the research basically identifies that there are some categories. One category is working memory. Another category is response inhibition, um, control of attention, and then cognitive flexibility, so important. The, the nice thing about healthy executive function is that it helps us adapt as successful social human beings. Um, when we don't have good executive functioning, we run into challenges. We, you know, we, we make little mistakes, little faux pas in our relationships. Maybe we don't learn as easily. The skills are actually a separate thing. And the skills are really what my life is all about. Um, and I have some stories. I was thinking about you this week. And I saw I've even got little tiny stories that people go, oh, I see. So the executive function skills are actually the cognitive skills that you use, right, for goal-directed and socially meaningful behavior. So when I say attention or self-regulation or self-control or organization or planning or previewing, those are all what I would call executive function skills. And what is so exciting, Janine, is that we can actually teach those skills. We can start teaching them as early as 18 to 24 months of age. I know a lot of people are surprised by that, but us, because I'm in, I was in developmental pediatrics and I, I fellowed in developmental pediatrics. So I, I've got a little bit, maybe more awareness than the average academician about what you can say to a two-year-old to get them to start thinking and becoming a critical thinker. That is incredible. I actually never thought about it starting that young. And I think partially because I've always worked in elementary schools. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're like really focusing, but obviously it should be able to start that young, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. And what I was thinking when I was thinking about you yesterday is that I think the key to the very young children is to help them think, plan things out, think things out and behave with intention. 
And just think about it. It can be just putting little squares in a cup, little blocks in a cup. I put one in and you put one in. Oh, wait, let's see. We have two. Let's pull them out. You want to pull them out? You pull them out. It's that it's a slow um, process of letting them do the skills and let them do the thinking. And you're actually almost the Socratic guide. And so I think the number one thing that's hard about implementing executive function, like development as a parent is that we're in a hurry and we're like, put on your shoes. Okay. I'll tie your shoes and wait, you know, that that shirt has a stain on it. I'll pull it off. I'm a lot slower. (laughs) Like, oh my golly, look at your shoes. And then they look at their shoes and I'm like, isn't that funny? They kind of look different. And oh, Oh my, I put on two different shoes. Oh, they're adorable. Do you want to wear them that way? So it's this, you know, that's what the cognitive conversation is. It's really helping the child. It's not just your shoes aren't matching, change your shoes, you know? It's interesting you say that because it, it, what it reflects is the need to slow down. Mm-hmm. And I think the need to slow down for families in general is really important because it is, if I can ask, off- always feel like there's rush, rush, rush. You've got to get there. You've got to get this place. You've got this appointment. You've got to do this. And if we can take a breath and slow down for ourselves and slow down for them, how much more can we build in for kids so that they can learn these skills by themselves, like and for themselves, they can do these things for themselves. You know, there's some, I love something about the, uh, you know, like the Montessori, like they get the code on by themselves, like things that they can figure they're able to do, but it means that we have to slow it down Mm -hmm. as the parents and we have to be intentional about it. I love these words, purposeful, intentional, slowing down. And we use all of these words with the parents and the children with whom we we work. Now, it's interesting that you say slowing down because I know we're not talking about musical thinking today, but I will tell you that Um, there is literature that says that teaching a child to slow down might be one of the best gifts you can give them because children right now are receiving so much rapid stimuli and they're needing to pro and they're not even processing fully, but they have to process quickly. So as an example, I might be talking to a child and I've got my hands out, like I'm holding their hands and they might be little and I might be too, and then I might just stop here in here and just slow things down and then we can begin to have our conversations and you even slow down too so you know we're not chatting about musicality but musicality is one of the keys to self-regulation and so if you're having trouble slowing down it's not only become a meditator which is great or practice mindfulness which is also great it's you can use your body in the moment and just slow down I, you know, you hit on something that I talk about all the time, which is, you know, mindfulness. There's a lot of great research out there about that, but there's lots of different ways to be mindful. And there's lots of different ways that you can slow down and pay attention to what's going on in the moment. It doesn't have to be the way that we traditionally think of mindfulness. There's mindful mm-hmm. walking, there's mm-hmm. mindful mm-hmm. movement. And to, and for those kids who can't do the sort of sitting and letting like having the train go through your mind and like the mm-hmm. bubbles and yeah. the some kids don't work that way and that's okay mm-hmm. there's other ways that we can help them do that mindfulness piece so that they can uh, they can get that slowing down they can get that pausing and reflecting that we need to have I love what you just said. And the the thing is that there's this space between, and even right now I felt myself slow down, right? There's this space between us. And in that space between us is where we do our growing, developing, relating, connecting. And I just wrote down some of the four words that you said, you know, simply being present. Like I don't need to go buy a product on mindfulness, even though I have many, (laughs) including yours. Um, I just can say, to, and I do this sometimes, like maybe I get off an intense research call and so I'm revved up and excited. And I say, okay, now you're about to see a so-and-so and your commitment is to be present, alert, and focused and just use the mantra. And then it just shifts you in. So I, I love everywhere you go, there you are. 
So you're bringing your humanity and your compassion and your love and your skills everywhere you go. It can even be in the grocery store. You know, I was talking to this clerk the other day and she looked so stressed out. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to ask you how you are today. And she said, oh, thank you so much for noticing. And I said, yeah, sometimes things can be tricky. And then she went into this whole thing about how the public can be really mean. And, you know, I was just paying for my groceries, you know, and it was just like, a little moment of caring, you know? And connection, which Mm -hmm. is huge. And to remember that people who are out in the world aren't just, you know, they're not just robots who are doing their job. They're people with families and Mm -hmm. stressors and other things going on. And sometimes all they want is a little bit of connection and a pause to Mm -hmm. stop and think and pay and notice just Mm. notice them. Stop thinking, notice. (laughs) Now I got to write notice on my book. Um, May I also, (laughs) you know, you and I could talk for hours, but you know, the other thing that you're really making me understand right now, Janine, is how important narrative language is throughout the lifespan to develop these executive function skills. So maybe if your child is in the lowest third right? Of cognition or learning or attention, or then you'll come to somebody like me and I've got interventions. Yet for all the other people, we need to help our typical kids build their executive function skills too. And so I was, I was making notes before we met, you know, using language like, Hey, what's our plan here? What is it we're going to do in what order? You know, just saying those kinds of things that make us think we're going from point A to point B, let's think about how we're gonna get there. Um, And I wrote some more. Oh, and just, you know, really kind of describing like even as young as 18 or 24 months of age, we can talk about high schoolers too, if you want, but just describing, oh, you love the, you love the um, fiber squares. Oh, they fell on the floor what are we going to do? You know, and just walking them through, they fell on the floor and that's totally okay. We're just going to pick them up, you know, or I was interacting with a child this week and my clock wasn't working. So I don't just go grit the clock and change and say, wait, you know what? I say, oh my golly, what's going on with the clock? And then they look and I say, you know, we could lift that off the wall. It's not very heavy. And then they start to go and I say, okay, let's make a plan. Would you like to be the one that takes it off the, yes, okay, I can agree to that. It's a light clock, it's a safe thing to do. So I'm using this narrative language to help them see. And then they flip it over. They didn't know to do that. So we walk it through that. Oh, I think it needs a battery. We better go discover. I use this word discover, which I actually learned from Wellington Alexander. Let's go discover what fits. And so I don't just pull out the right one. I pull out all of them. So it is true. My husband, because I parented this way too, my husband does say, you know, Lynn, you do this whole thing the hard way. So you don't have to do it all the time. (laughs) But if you're working with kids who are having executive function uniquenesses, or maybe your kids don't have formal diagnoses, but they really need some help with their planning and previewing and organizing, talk them through things. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to hesitate because I know you, this is a little tough, but I teach parents, don't just order your kids around because you want to raise thinkers. And if you're doing all the thinking, they're not going to learn how to think. Right. And they, they need that opportunity. And to your husband's point, I used to work with a woman and she used to say to me, you, you, sometimes you do have to rush and you have to get them out, Mm -hmm. but you pick your thing. You pick Mm -hmm. one thing that you're going to focus on. You pick, okay, we're going to take our time to tie our shoes today. We're going to take our time to put on our jacket today. And I found that when I was younger, I was doing, when my kids were younger, I was doing a lot more of the, like everything was slowing down, but that made everything take too long. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And like, sometimes you just have to be places and that freedom of like, you can do it when you can. And other times, like you use the teachable moments when you have them. And Mm -hmm. then at other times you can move things along, but no, that you need to do that slowing slow stuff so that they can actually do it themselves. It's the whole point mm-hmm. of having kids is that they can launch and do it on their own, right? That's what we want for them. You know, I, I love what you've just said because I 
people are like, well, how do I build skills in my kids? And I say, well, we sprinkle them. We don't have to sit down and have this slow movement because we just saw a podcast with Lynn and Janine. We say, I'm going to sprinkle this skill. So if I'm in a hurry and I can feel that I'm intense, I'm like, kids, look at my eyes. I got to tell you the truth. We're late for the doctor's office. All right. That means chop, chop, you know, and you can, that's okay too. It's, you're just commenting on the truth of the moment. You're not being the perfect parent, (laughs) which none of us are. (laughs) And none of us want, our kids don't want perfect parents. We all, we all have emotions and stresses and things get overwhelmed. And other times it's feeling better. And so we have a little bit more freedom to have, to slow down. Oh my goodness. This is so cool. So you, it's interesting. You were talking about that language for younger kids. And then you mentioned yeah. something about teenagers. Can you tell yeah. me a little bit more about how you would do that with a teenager? Um, I do this stuff all the time with teenagers. And what's interesting about the teenagers in this current practice, because I've been in four practices because I've practiced a long time, is that we have mostly young kids, but adolescents have dyslexia too. So when they first come in and they see the small kids and they see the balls and they're like, I don't know about this lady. Yet I tell them right away, this is what you do with, this is what I do with teenagers is that we're collaborators. We're partners in building our brains. So sometimes we're gonna have some brain lessons. Sometimes we're gonna have brain activities, but the most important thing between you and me is that you advocate for yourself. You say, yes, Dr. Lynn, I like this activity. No, Dr. Lynn, I don't like this activity because you're like four years away from being an adult. So we're gonna work together on this, okay? So then once I I call that like setting the culture, you know, that, you know, in Bloom, we do a lot about making, creating a culture of kindness and respect. Then after that, I, with teenagers, I'm a little more, may I, you know, may I, may I notice a really cool thing that you just did? Cause I don't want them to feel inspected. And so then, then, then they're kind of like screaming, you know, okay. And I'm like, well, there's this skill, a cognitive skill called planning. And you just meticulously and thoughtfully planned, you were going to do this, then you were going to do that. And can I go a little bit further? And they're like, okay. And I'm like, that really allowed you and me to be connected and working together in our brief amount of time today. And so for the adolescents, it's not just building the skills, it's helping them feel good about themselves again, because children who are neuro unique and teenagers can sometimes feel deflated and they can have learned helplessness. So I'm all about the mastery, agency, and salience. This is my personal opinion um, for teens, you know? Oh, And I'm kind of like that with our colleagues too. It's not like, well, I'm Dr. Kenny and I wrote all these books and I know all this stuff. I'm, I just don't feel like that. I feel like, you know, stuff and I know stuff and, and let's figure it out together. You know what? it's probably going to be better when we do figure it out together. I, I love working in a team and collaborating, um, especially with people across discipline, because I feel like you learn mm-hmm. so much more. You know, one of my favorite group experiences was working with my OT, uh, with an OT who happens to be my best friend now. We weren't, mm-hmm. bef- we weren't friends before we started running the group together. But to come to a group with preschoolers or elementary school with um, an OT mind and a therapist mind, yeah. the two of us together really fun stuff, stuff Mm -hmm. that I'm still using to this day. But you know what I think going back to the teenagers, you create a space that makes them feel safe and Mm -hmm. they're comfortable to be brave and vulnerable with you. And that's Mm -hmm. really cool. And they feel like you are also um, making them feel like they are part of it, that it is, Mm -hmm. you are a partnership and that's what they want. They want to be taken seriously. They want to be heard. They want their opinions to be out there. And you do that for them. So that's pretty darn cool. (laughs) There's a Canadian um, psychologist. And now I'm like really reaching back. Um, Her name is Jennifer Kolari. And she wrote a book a long time ago. And in the initial, this was before people were talking about neurotransmitters and, um, you know, positive um, endorphins and stuff like that. And she said in her book, you know, teenagers want to feel enlivened and connected just like young children. 
you just do it a little differently. And she says, you know, I'm not going to speak for her, but my recollection of her book was like, she would be like, with teenagers. And she was shocked that they wouldn't reject her. Now you couldn't do it in public. These are in one-on-one relationships, but you know, they, they like that too. And that gives them positive hormones as well. So if I catch myself singing, which I do unconsciously a lot, um, (laughs) there's Dr. Lynn walking down the hall singing again. Um, I will look at the teenager and go, oh my gosh, I was just like, I was just singing a rhythm song (laughs) and I make myself you know, like, do you know what I mean? Like, we don't all have to be experts and we don't have to be puffed up. We can be like friendly and we can catch ourselves. Or if I'm doing ballad of X or the ball work or something, and it's, I, I'll be like, oh, this is so hard for me. And I'll reach up and I'll pretend to pull out my hair. Um, but, but it's all genuine and honest in the moment. So, you know, we don't have to, you know what I mean? Like teenagers are human too. They're really, they're really friendly. They're, they want to be connected. They want to feel masterful. They just sometimes are a little defended because usually they've experienced so many, so many losses. Right. And it, you, what, what strikes me is it's, it's a real connection. Like you're being a real person with them. You're not trying to put on airs. You're not trying to pretend like you have everything all together all mm-hmm. the time. Sometimes you don't. And I do the same thing when I work with, with teenagers in therapy, like, oh, that didn't go well. Like, let me tell, <laughs> let's talk about that. Like, you know what I mean? Like that did not go as I anticipated this. Let's try it again. <laughs> like, I love that. I love that authenticity. Oh, uh, it makes such a huge difference. Oh my goodness. Lynn, I could talk to you forever, but I want to be respectful of your time. Yeah, so. And everyone else's time. I mean, thank you for <laughs> hanging out during this interesting chat. You know, it's, yeah, it's fun, to, it's fun to be loving. It's fun to be real. It's yeah. fun to be compassionate. It's fun to help children raise their self-esteem. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's, it's really a rewarding, rewarding career. And there are many, I mean, I could go to my library and pull out sorts of all sorts of books, but really what I learned here today, and I think I'd probably talk too much, but is be connected, be real, be authentic, slow down. And then think about what the other person is needing Yes. You know, there's that whole, we're all on a journey. I'm not interested in telling you about my needs and my journey. I'm really interested in knowing what you need and what is your journey. Um, I think that that can really help with all the kids too. Yeah, absolutely. So if people want to learn more about your work, where should they go? Um, you know, it's Lynn Kenny. It's easy to find <laughs> L-Y-N-N-E-K-E-N-N-E-Y. I've been around a long time. Yep. Um, and I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes, which will be great. Okay. So people can go and look at all of your wonderful work. And I think I've talked about Bloom before. I've talked about musical thinking. That's some of your stuff that's older, but so amazing and good that I love yeah. to share about it. Yeah. And we have um, all sorts of new stuff. I've got a new yeah. book for 2023. That's called My Tension Engine. And then we have a new cognitive motor program after like eight years of intensive work with our team. So um, you'll be hearing about that. It's called Cognitive Moves. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's really, I don't think we're ever going to stop, right? I mean, no. <laughs> every day there's just, there's so many people to help and there's so much interesting stuff, you know? And there's so much more to learn and so many more yes. people to connect with. So that's, yes. I, I love that piece of it. So the last question I always ask all my guests is what is one way that you like to rest and recharge and relax? Um, I do two things very consistently. One is I, um, I, I don't even know if you can call it meditate. I'm going to say sit because I don't think I'm that evolved. I listen to these wonderful, wonderful chimes. They're extraordinarily calming. And I draw I, I love, I'm a, I'm a novice. I'm not an artist, but I, I draw my friend's houses for them. I just drew my dad's house for him. I just draw and we cook as a family whenever we're relaxing. So yeah, at this stage um, of life, given all that we've been through, I really believe in, in, you know, turning on that default mode network and chilling. Um, Yes. So that's how I do it. The main thing I would do if I'm alone is draw. Wow. That's really what about cool. you? I want to hear what you do. And then we can say so long. 
Oh my goodness. What do I do? Um, I like to walk. That's actually something mm-hmm. that I've been doing a lot of recently. Um, so I walk, I listen to podcasts or listen to mm-hmm. audiobooks because I don't always find I have enough time to sit down and read, although I do still appreciate like a paper book. Um, I really love that piece of it. And the other thing I do is dance. I just, I've oh, discovered, great. yeah, I, it's really about the music actually, which is so mm. funny. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. So I've discovered um, the Peloton app. So I don't have a Peloton bike or any of that stuff, mm-hmm. but their classes are incredible because I love the music playlists. I'm all about the playlists. Wow. And so that's like, I've done a lot of different classes and a lot of different um, apps in terms of like working out. And this one, I I just, I love it because of the music and because Mm. of the, like the dance and the, like the energy of this, the instructors, it's just, it's great. So for me, I like to move my body and I like Mm. to move it in a way that is like in rhythm and usually dancing and like, I'll dance in the kitchen, like my kids Mm -hmm. are they're like, are we dancing again? I'm like, yes, we're dancing. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep, it's happening. <laughs> so you know, it's, in saying so long, the detail in which you described that was exactly what we did want to do with our children. You know, you were like, I really like the music and I like the moving my body. And, and that's what we do with the children. We're like, I really like that we did, you know, we did that with a plan. I love that I saw you stop and think about that you know, or even help me. I'm the one revved up. How am I going to stop and think about it? Just those little details. Those are the sprinkling of like the seeds of cognition that we all need to use. Oh, that's a great way to end. Thank you so Mm -hmm. much for coming on the podcast, Lynn. Thanks for having me.